Okay, we're going to try this again. Now, while we are praying here, um, I have all of our team here watching where we need to watch. If you are watching this online on Facebook Live, I need you to comment as I'm praying. My son-in-law Jordan here is going to make sure that you are saying a thumbs up that you can hear so that we don't get 12 minutes into it like we did last week and find out that people aren't able to hear. So as soon as, as, soon as someone's on, give us a thumbs up that you can hear, and I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we're going to get started. Lord, thank you for the message that you gave to Joel, uh, both for Judah at that time and for all the rest of us ever since, for the 2,800 years or so since then. Particularly, thank you for the way that it speaks to us today, the message that Joel has for, for us today, Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to study this. Lord, speak to us, open our eyes, still our hearts, and let us be totally focused on what it is you have for us in your word tonight. Lord, give us the application you want us to take from this and share with others. Lord, just speak to us and, uh, and let our hearts be open to hearing from you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, is anyone on Facebook Live that they can tell us if we're doing okay? Okay, great. All right, so last week we, were, we did the first seven verses of Joel, and I also did a little introduction, and uh, we, um, we found out 12 minutes into it that no one online could hear. <laughs> so we're going to do a quick little review of what we did last week. The reason I decided to do that as well is I think if I don't do a review and I start asking you guys questions, you're going to look at me like deer in the headlights and not, uh, not totally be able to say what it was we studied last week. So I just want to go through some of that. But I will ask as I get started here, uh, we're reviewing the major points of what we learned last week in the first seven verses of Joel. So what is a major point that you learned last week. I'm going to throw out a few. I want you guys to throw out a few also of what are the major points. So one thing is, Joel was sent to warn Judah of the judgments coming upon them because of their sin and to urge them to repent and turn back to God. That, in a nutshell, it's like, okay, we can all go home. That was his purpose. That's what it's all about. Well, there's more. There's, of course, a whole lot more. Um, there's not much known about Joel. He was a prophet to the nation of Judah, southern kingdom, but we're not told in scripture even when Joel lived. So there is a, a speculation that he, he served during Joash's reign, which was 835 to 736 BC, and that's significant. If that is correct, that's significant. That would have been before the, before the northern kingdom was exiled to Assyria, right before it, and it would have been before the uh, southern kingdom, Judah, was exiled to Babylon. So that's kind of key as we go through and we're, we're thinking about this, um, but we don't really know for sure. And really, in the grand scheme of things, from our standpoint, for our application, it doesn't matter. We could go through and we could argue, well, it's this, it's this, we don't care. We don't really care. We're just going to say 2,800 years and probably before either of those exiles. And, and that's good enough because what we really want to focus on is what is the application for us? That's always what we, we want to do the best we can to understand scripture in context. But we want to walk away with what's our application. So that's what we really want to focus on. Um, now, these Jews at this time, they were living prosperously. And when there is prosperity, there becomes complacency right along with the prosperity. So they were prosperous and they became complacent and they were kicking back and enjoying life and God wasn't in the picture. They had forgotten their purpose. They had forgotten their God. They were focused on themselves. They were focused on idolatry. They were just focused on selfishness. And uh, that idolatry and that selfishness God had had enough of it. So Joel is sent to warn the Jews that they need to turn back to God and quit indulging, just focused on their self. They need to turn back to God because the judgment that they're seeing 
it's just going to get worse. There's going to be a whole lot more judgment if they don't turn back to God. So the focus, the theme of the book of Joel, these three little chapters, is what? What's the major, what's one major word that we can sum it all up in is the purpose. Repentance. The theme is repentance. The need to repent while there's still time. And that's why when we see that that's the theme, we think, oh, okay, this probably relates to us today. It probably really speaks to us today. We also learned from Scripture that the locust plague they were experiencing was absolutely a judgment from God. And we talked about the scripture, and I put it up there in case you didn't get to to note it last week. It's basically all of Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28 says, if you follow me faithfully, here's how you'll be blessed. And if you turn away from me, here's how you'll be cursed. And what what I want to just zero in on for a second is Deuteronomy 28. I didn't put a screen up. Deuteronomy 28, 38 and 45, which says, You will sow much seed in the field, but you will harvest little because locusts will devour it. And then 45 says, All these curses will come on you. Read all of Deuteronomy 28 to get the all, the details here. All these curses will come on you. They will pursue you and overtake you until you're destroyed because you did not obey the Lord your God and observe the commands and decrees he gave you. And then I wanted to add on Amos 4, 9, which says, Locusts devoured your fig and olive trees, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. So from those we see, they would have known when they saw this locust plague, oh, this is the judgment of God, because they were intimately familiar with Deuteronomy 28. They knew what this said. So they would have recognized it. You would have thought except it doesn't appear that they were. Joel recognized it, but it doesn't appear that they were really cognizant of what was going on. So we concluded that today, if we see famine, earthquakes, plagues, pestilence, COVID is pestilence, by the way, pestilence, if we see this stuff coming upon our nation, what do we need to do? We need to repent while there's still time. We absolutely need to repent while there's still time and not just repent for ourselves. We need to follow the example of Daniel, which is to also repent for our nation on behalf of our nation. And last week when we were talking about this, we gave the example of Daniel 9, that if you look at the first part of Daniel 9, he's praying and he is just sharing his soul, just crying out his soul, realizing that his ancestors, his nation had sinned, and that's why they were carried off into exile. And he's repenting, not just on his behalf, but on the behalf of his nations, our ancestors. And it says throughout his prayer, we, we have sinned, we have sinned, we have sinned. Well, if you go and you read Daniel, Daniel really wasn't the guy who had sinned. He was, here he was in Babylon, and he was staying faithful to God. But his prayer is, we have sinned. And it's really easy, I think, for me to say, my government, my leaders, and I need to be saying, we have sinned. Lord, please forgive us. We have sinned. I need to be pointing my finger right at myself. Because my prayer is going to be much more correct if I'm doing that. If I have the right screen up, yeah, I'm seeing a different screen up here. Okay, the, the problem is, just like in Joel's time, we have people today, we, we are kicking back, ignoring God, ignoring the warnings and the alarms that he's sounding in front of us. As a matter of fact, it seems like there's a delusion right now over people's eyes. I mean, you can look and go, man, this is so clear when I think about what's coming, but it appears like there's just a delusion over people's eyes. And that's what seems to be going on in Joel's time. As he's saying, you have to repent while there's still time. You have to repent. This is just going to get worse. It's going to get a whole bunch worse. You don't even know about the day of the Lord yet. I mean, this is just famine. And it was horrible. I mean, not famine. I'm sorry, locusts. And it was just horrible. And I feel like we're, we, 
we're in that same mindset today. So that's a review of last time. That's overview plus first seven verses of Joel 1. Is there anything you remember from last time that you would like to add on to that before we go into verses 8 through 13 of Joel 1? Okay, let's go. Let's jump into verses 8 through 13 of Joel chapter 1. And it says, Wail like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn, the ministers of the Lord. The field is ruined. The land mourns, for the grain is ruined. The new wine dries up. Fresh oil fails. Be ashamed, O farmers, wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine dries up and the fig tree fails, the pomegranate, the palm also, and the apple tree. All the trees of the field dry up. Indeed, rejoicing dries up from the sons of men. Gird yourselves with sackcloth and lament, O priest. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Come spend the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Joel is crying out here, trying to get the people to understand the severity of the situation. But let's pick through this. Let's kind of see if we can understand that. Verse 8 has a little bit of symbolism in it that we need to understand. And you won't hear me say that word very often at all because I just look at everything literally. But there's a little bit of symbolism here. Who is the virgin referring to. And in verse 8, wail like a virgin girded with sackcloth. Do we know? Maybe it's a virgin. Maybe it's actually a virgin. Could it be anything else? Fred, what do you think? Perhaps Israel. Maybe Israel. Maybe it's Israel. Yeah, it could be Israel. Might even, some even say it's a personification of the land itself which kind of would match what we see in verse 10 as it says, the land mourns. So it might be. Uh, What does it mean when it says girded with sackcloth? What's sackcloth? Could be both. Say say that again, Fred. As far as virgin, Israel could be the people and the land both. Yeah, could be both. Yeah, Yeah, it sure could be. Okay, so with that thought, what's sackcloth? Robin? Yeah, Dan, in Daniel 9, he mentions it too. He's mourning with sackcloth and ashes. So right. Some kind of mourning so sackcloth today, it, it's normally dark, but the sackcloth we see, when I think of sackcloth, I think of a gunny sack, of a sack of potatoes, a sack of rice. Can you imagine cutting that out and putting that on And they're not putting it on as a shirt. They're putting it on around their loins. That wouldn't be very comfortable, would it? Can you? I mean, that's scratchy. That that would make wool sound really comfortable. But can you imagine that around your loins? The purpose of it is to be very uncomfortable. Cheryl. Okay, I, it, it's to make you feel, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. She said something bland um, to just not make you think of yourself. Is that right, Cheryl? So others see you as bright and shiny. Okay, as others see you as bright and shiny. It's actually not to bring attention to yourself at all, uh, although it is an outward sign of sorrow. It's an outward sign of sorrow that would be associated with mourning for a funeral, but it's not just a sign of sorrow, it's a sign of something else. Take a guess what that might be. Repentance. It's a sign of repentance. Sack, sackcloth was, was worn for mourning, and it was also worn as a sign of repentance. So what do you think Joel is telling them to do? Chip? Yeah. Yeah, like Nineveh. Explain what you mean. Jonah? Right. Yeah. So Chip's remembering when God sent Nineveh, when God sent Jonah to Nineveh, and he very haphazardly said, Repent or you're, you know, or God's going to wipe you out. 
And they took it really seriously and they repented and they all put on sackcloth and ashes and it said, even the animals, even the animals. Can you imagine how uncomfortable those animals were <laughs> with, with sackcloth, the people too, but they showed repentance. They showed great repentance. It's actually showing God that we're serious, that we're not just saying, oh, my bad, sorry. It's a, it's a sign that our heart is actually repentant. Now, we're probably not going to go put on sackcloth today, but the point of it is, are we showing God that our heart is broken about the sin that's taking us away from him? That's the point of the sackcloth. Verse 9 tells us why they should mourn, and what is that? Why should they mourn, according to verse 9? The plague, or the locusts, it was preventing them to worship through the grain offerings and the drink offerings. This was a part of their worship, their, their daily need to worship, and they couldn't do it. So then, even if they know they have to turn back to God, they can't do the grain offerings and the drink offerings because everything's destroyed that they need. They need the wine, they need the grain, but because of the devastation that was all around them, they didn't have, they couldn't produce the flour, they couldn't produce the, the drink offerings, the wine for the drink offerings, so they could not honor God and worship him. Sue? I was going to say, they're, they're missing the most important part. God doesn't care about that stuff. He wants their hearts. Right. So I thought of the same thing too. Sue is saying that uh, they were caught up and, and kind of stopped from worshiping because they didn't have their drink offerings and their, uh, their grain offerings. And we could easily see that today. If a tornado came through and wiped out this church, would it stop our Bible study? Would it stop our worship on Sunday? That's kind of the mindset. Oh, we can't worship now. We can't study the Bible now because our building's gone. And, and the mindset that we should have is, no, I'm not going to let anything stop me from worshiping God. We can go sit out there in chairs. We're going to continue worshiping. We can sit out in our cars. We can figure out a way. We can gather at a park. We can figure out a way to continue worshiping. However, with the drink offerings and the grain offerings, that was a part of the requirement for them for worship. But I still think there was an element there. I thought of that, I thought of that same thing. Um, that we are so tied to the pageantry, to the, to the, um, the steps. You know, here's, we come in, here's what we do. You ever go to a church that's not your church and you think, well, I don't know what to do. I don't know, what, when do I do what? Is there a list of things I do when? You, know, you just come in and you worship. Just come in and worship Jesus. And come in and, and get, hear from him in his word. That's the, we don't care about the steps. That if we just do that, if we just give God our whole heart, that's what they needed to do. Also, that's what God was looking for. Uh, verse 10 and 12 go on to tell us it's not just the grain and wine, but everything. Everything was destroyed. The fig trees, the pomegranates, the palm, the apple tree, all the trees. Could it be Joel is saying, wake up, look around at the devastation that their sin caused everything around them. Because we often think our sin doesn't hurt anybody else, right? I mean, yeah, I'm, I, I committed a little sin, but it didn't affect anyone but me. It's just, a, it's just a little white lie no one else knows. That's never true, though, is it? Our sin affects Everybody around us, it affects people around us. Boy, some sins just destroy everybody around us. And in this case, the sin devastated not just the people and their food source, but the land. Everything was destroyed. All of Judah was destroyed because of their sin. 
And they weren't seeing it. They weren't seeing the consequence of their sin. Do we? Do we see the consequence? We can see the cons- I can see the consequence of your sin. Do I see the consequence of my sin? Or my sins don't matter. Oh, but your sins, your sins are big. That's kind of how we do, isn't it? I need to look in the mirror and say, what's the consequence of my sin? And what are the sins that I need to repent of? In this case, their sin devastated everything and hurt everyone. Verse 11, it says the farmer should be ashamed. Why should the farmers be ashamed? The farmers did what? Hmm? Well, okay. Uh, could be, could be. Maybe she, Sue said maybe they sinned. Yeah, I think they were all sinning. I was taking that as uh, the farmers should be ashamed because they have nothing left. They were the ones feeding, they were feeding their families, they were pro- providing food. They couldn't provide anything. They couldn't provide the grain offerings. They couldn't provide the, the drink offerings. That They are realizing the devastation and the tie to the devastation. The farmers provide for us still today. You know, what if the farmers couldn't provide? You know, what, what about us? What if we can't provide? All of our hard work is destroyed. We would feel... Uh, just defeated over that, right? It seems like there's an element here that they just don't quite realize it yet. They just don't quite realize the severity of what's going on. What else do you guys get out of this before we go on to the next passage, 14 through 20? What I miss? Did the symbolism end with verse 8? Tell us, Fred. Tell us what you're thinking. Fred's saying, did the symbolism and he might need a microphone, Chip, because he's getting ready to... That, that uh, microphone is on, and it will be in the, in the uh, uh, mix where everybody can hear it online as well. <laughs> Here's Fred, Chip says. <laughs> so who's the farmers if the symbolism does not end at verse 8. Ah. So you're saying they're part of the virgin girded with sackcloth? Yes. Okay. What else are you, what else are you pointing out about that? So there's no harvest. Who's right. supposed to be doing the harvesting? The farmers. Aren't we supposed to be harvesting? What? Aren't we supposed to be planting seeds to mm. harvest? Right. Right. Very good. Anything else? I was thinking maybe they didn't plant their best. Well, and as he's talking about planting seeds, what is he talk what does he mean by planting seeds? Sharing the gospel, sharing God. They're they're pulled away from God, they're focused on themselves. So this is interesting as they're talking about farmers, vine dressers, is this also talking about the ministers? who are not doing it. It's this all related to the same. They, they weren't focused on God. Very interesting. Anything else, Fred, on this passage? Not right now. Not, right now. On, this, not on this one. It, anybody else have anything on this passage? Chip? Well, if you don't get that microphone, you're going to have to talk louder. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Chip's saying, it's also saying the priests should wail. Yeah. Oh, ministers of the altar, which would be the priests, right? Okay, so they're not having the attitude they should have. They're just oblivious to how their sin has caused this. Let's go on. Verses 14 through 20. Consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near and it will come as destruction from the Almighty. Has not food been cut off before our eyes? Gladness and joy from the house of our God. The seeds shrivel under their clods. The storehouses are desolate. 
The barns are torn down, for the grain is dried up. How the beasts groan. The herds of cattle wander aimlessly because there's no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep suffer. To you, O Lord, I cry, for fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame has burned up all the trees of the field. Even the beasts of the field pant for you, for the water brooks are dried up, and fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Okay, so he's, he's making a very vivid picture for us here, isn't he? Why does Joel instruct the, the people in verse 14 to consecrate themselves? Consecrate a fast. Why? What's the purpose of a fast? To repent, okay. What else? Yeah, okay, to, to draw us close to God, to focus our thoughts on God. As we fast, as we give up food or something else and we think about what we're giving up, it's to make us realize, no, it's not the food that I need to be hungering for, it's God. I need to draw myself close to God and hear from him. And so he's saying, consecrate a fast so that people approach God with humility, saying, it's God that I need. Yes, I'm hungry for food. I have no food, but it's God that I need. I need to turn to him. In the Old Testament, people fasted during times of calamity in order to focus their attention on God and demonstrate, demonstrate that their heart was really changed. So they're putting on sackcloth. They're going to fast. They're showing physical signs, but their heart has to be given to God. Okay? Uh, so Joel is telling them, you guys, you gotta, you got to get with it here. you got to get the time that we're in, what's going on. you got to repent while there's still time. you got to get this. Only he's saying it a whole lot louder, right? Um, verse 15, he says, The day of the Lord is near. You see all this? The day of the Lord is near. What's the day of the Lord? Robin. Um, my amplified took me to Zephaniah to say that it says the great day of the Lord is a day of wrath, a day of distress. This is chapter 1, verse 15 in Zephaniah. Okay. The day of, is a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish. Okay. A day of ruin and devastation. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. A day of darkness and gloom and a day of clouds and thick darkness. All right. So she just read from Zephaniah describing the day of the Lord. There's one thing that's not described there. It's actually not described in any of the verses about the day of the Lord, but it's something that we need to understand. The day of the Lord is not a day. It is not a 24-hour day. It is a period of time that's much longer than a 24-hour day. The day of the Lord is a period of judgment on the earth, on the people. Okay. Most of the time, the day of the Lord is speaking of the judgment after this current age, after the church age. It's speaking of the judgments that go from the tribulation all the way through to after the millennium to the great white throne judgment. It's speaking of all of those judgments. Sometimes it could be speaking of a specific judgment, which is the case here. He's looking at the judgment that they are going through, and he's prophesying about the day of the Lord to come. But what's interesting is, uh, I want to make sure I don't get ahead of myself here. I think I'm still on track. Um, he says that the day of the Lord is near. Why does he say it's near? What does that mean? And I, and I want to point something out to you. Jesus also said that um, his, that he would, in Revelation, Jesus said that he would be coming again soon. That was in AD 95. We're now in 2022. And so Joel said the day of the Lord is near. What does it mean? Do you remember what it means in Revelation when Jesus said soon? That he'll be returning soon. It means when, when it happens, uh, it's very matter of fact. It's very definite. It's going to 
absolutely happen. I'm looking at this the same way. It's near. Near means it is definite. It is going to happen. And so here's Joel looking at this locust devastation and going, wow, this is God's judgment. This means the day of the Lord is definite also. We can look at this and go, God means business. When he says, if you don't repent and turn back to me, you're going to experience my judgment, he means it. That's what, that's what he's saying, because guess what? The day of the Lord has not happened yet. This was 2,800 years ago, and the day of the Lord has not happened yet. But um, I'm going to get ahead of myself. I've got to make sure I'm sticking with the notes, otherwise I skip a thing. So we'll keep that thought. Any other thoughts on the day of the Lord before I jump on to the next verse here? Are we thinking that Joel is talking about two different things? Yes. Like the first thing, the locust invasion, and then also the down the road thing that we haven't even experienced yet. Right, so he's looking at what's going on and saying, that means this. This, this locust devastation means that what is forecast to still come, it's really going to come. It's really going to come because we see God's judgment is serious. Isn't it just like a reassurance? You know, he's telling this is going to happen. It's been said it's going to happen. And the fact that... Oh, and now it's happening again. And it's going to happen again. Yes. If we don't get our acts together, he's just proven to us. He means business and it's going to... This isn't the first time. Right. Right. But it's the first time this, this group of people is seeing it up close and personal. And so Joel is trying to say, you see this? This means we've got to repent now, you guys, or it's going to get a whole lot worse. And to me, that's the message that we should be getting. That's the exact message that we should be getting because we're looking around going, oh, what did Jesus say in Matthew 24, 4 through 8 about birth pains? He said, earthquakes are going to increase in frequency and intensity and lawlessness and apostasy and people falling under uh, delusion. As he said over and over, do not be deceived, do not be deceived, do not be deceived. He said that these things are going to increase. And guess what? We're seeing it. And so we should be saying as we see these birth pains, he means it. The tribulation that's still to come is real. He means it. We can see it's real because this stuff that we're seeing happening today is exactly what Jesus said is going to happen and the birth pains leading up to the tribulation at the end of the church age. So same mindset, different set of things. We don't have a bunch of locusts running around, but we can see that the, the things that Jesus forecasts that were going to come for the birth pains, we can see them happening in our time today. Let's look at 16 through 18. We started out studying Deuteronomy 28, mentioning that, mentioning the blessings that God promised them if they obeyed and the curses if they didn't obey. These people that Joel is is talking to, that he's ministering to, they they knew Deuteronomy 28. And so Joel has just said, guys, do you see this? This means the day of the Lord is coming. Now... In verses 16 through 18, he expands on that. And he's basically comparing, he's he's giving them a proof. Here, here's what I mean. Let's go through what Deuteronomy 28 said. It's like if we sit here and go through Deuteronomy, if I say, you know what, we're living through the birth pains. And then we put up Matthew 24, 4 through 8, and we start listing them off. What Jesus said. And then we start listing off the things that are happening right now. And you go, yep, yep. It matches. So that's what he's doing. He's listing them off in verses 16 through 18. Has not the food been cut cut off? Yep. The seeds shrivel under the clods, clods. The storehouses are desolate. The barns are torn down. The grain is dried up. The beast grown. Read Deuteronomy 28. And you'll go, oh, yeah. He's proving it to them that it is God's judgment, what they're seeing. He's waking them up. He's saying, wake up, wake up. Do you see this? Do you see, sorry if anyone, if I just scared anybody there. The fact that the locusts had destroyed their land was proof that they needed to immediately repent and fall on their knees in mourning and sackcloth 
in, in fasting. What do we need to do? What do we need to do? To me, that describes just the current events that are now. How's that, Sue? Sue said it describes the current events that's happening. Ah. Okay, so I'm going to repeat what she just said. So as we see the barns being torn down, we've had 20 um, manufacturing places. 20, the latest was a chicken farm in Minnesota where there were thousands and thousands of chickens that caught on fire. There's been 20. We're in June. There's been 20 of these things, 20 of these major fires at at food producing places all over the country. 20 of them. Hmm. What does that mean? What else, Sue? Well, and if there's no fertilizer, not enough fertilizer, the little seeds are going to shrivel. Ah. Right. Well, the seeds are going to grow. Okay. The storehouse is definitely going to be desolate because of that. Because there won't be any storehouse of grain. So Sue's saying the seeds are going to shrivel because the farmers don't have enough fertilizer. I'm going to add to that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to add to that. There is a problem with diesel prices right now. There's a problem with gas prices. All kinds, but there's a problem with diesel prices. Farmers, everything they have runs on diesel. They don't have fertilizer. They're going to have trouble affording gas. Guess what that means? That means the storehouses are going to be desolate. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, she's right. We're seeing this exact same stuff happening in our time. The wording is a slightly different, but it's the same stuff. And, and our, our culture, our nation, isn't realizing it. They're not getting it. They're not getting it. The fact that locusts had destroyed their land was proof that they needed to immediately repent and fall on their knees in mourning before God. God is bringing judgment, and the people were under a delusion, not realizing what was going on around them, and the fact that it was God's judgment. It does sound exactly like our time today, doesn't it? Just exactly like our time today. So then in uh, verse 19, Joel changes his attention from the people to God, and he starts crying out to God. We have no control over the people around us. We can only try to help them see the approaching judgment. We need to be saying, do you see this? Do you see this? Do you see this? Do you see this? We need to try to, not blaming, not blaming, but realizing this isn't happening because a certain elected official is now in office. That's not why it's happening. It, God's allowing this to happen. We need to be praying that everyone around us wakes up. And repents is really what we need to be doing. We need to be asking for forgiveness, turning back to God, making sure our hearts are aligned with God, and repenting. So we also need to prepare for the judgment. Sue talked about the things that will cause famine for us. Are you guys realizing that we very well could have rolling power outages this summer, over this next month? We could be losing power regularly. Are you aware of that? I mean, they're, they're warning us for that, about this all over the Midwest. Will it hit Nebraska? I don't know. They're saying all over the Midwest because of two things. One, they're switching the power grid over to solar faster than they have battery backups for it. So as there's heat waves, they're expecting um, to have to have rolling blackouts. The other thing is they're telling us that just like they're telling the, these egg uh, plants that have been burning up, they're also warning them about cyber attacks. That's interesting, isn't it? That there's, one, that there's fires and cyber attacks on food processing places. Isn't that interesting? That, that would take out our food source. But then on top of it, um, the power outages, there's also supposed to be cyber attacks on the power grids. And so part of the reason for potential rolling blackouts is they'll have to take down certain sections of the grid to figure out where the cyber attacks are. This stuff is, is coming. They're, we're being told 
This isn't me saying this. We're being told that this stuff is coming. And we're, we're going, well, we need to change our elected officials. I'm not, I'm not going to get into they or who or where. But you know what? God's the one that allows elected officials to be in office. And God's the one that's going to bless us or curse us. What do we need to do? We need to be praying for forgiveness. We need to be praying to support Israel. We need to be praying for Israel to be blessed. We need to be praying for whoever is in office here to be blessing Israel, not cursing Israel. If we're supporting Iran, we are not blessing Israel. We, we need to be praying for Israel to be blessed. These are things that are important to God. So we need to figure that out. Now, we need to share God's warnings and messages of salvation with everyone around us while there's still time. But in the end, we need to make sure that we are continuously crying out to God, we, for, for our sins, for my sins. And when we cry out to God with our whole heart, what does scripture say? Yeah. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. That's what the sackcloth and ashes was about. That's what, that's what the fasting is about. We need to seek God with our whole heart. Totally focused, seeking him with our whole heart. That's what God's wanting from us right now. We don't need to, I mean, it's obvious. We need to be turning to God with our whole heart. Unlike Joel, we've already seen God's salvation though, haven't we? We're on this side of the cross Joel was on that side of the cross. He, he was trusting in God, but he didn't know the salvation that God was going to offer. We do. We're on the finished side of the cross. We can look back at it and know that when we repent and we totally trust in Jesus, that we're forgiven and that we can know that we can know that we can know that we have eternal life. But we don't know how everyone else is going to choose. We don't know what's coming. We, don't, we know that we're going to go through birth pains. We know that if we trust in Jesus, we're not going to go through the tribulation. But we can use these things to start talking with people and sharing with people. Because the question is, who is it that we need to cry out to? Who is it that we need to, to warn about what's coming? Who is it? Uh, what's, what are you going to get out of this? What are you going to take from this as your application? What's God calling you to do? Who is he calling you to warn about the approaching judgments that we're likely going to see from any time over next week through the fall? You know, who could you tell and say, you know, those are signs of God's judgment so that they happen. And boy, if we're wrong, I'll happily be the crazy lady who's wrong, you know but I'd rather be telling people, warning people, please turn back to God. Who is God calling you to warn, to repent, and cry out to him while there's still time? Who? We're not getting to chapter two tonight. I thought that we would, but we're not getting to because it's quarter till, and I want to leave us time for application. So I, I thought last week we would just sail right through all of chapter one, and we could have but then we wouldn't have got as much out of it. I need to soak it up so that I can really go live it out. What about you? What, what is it you're taking away from Joel chapter one? What's your application that God is, is calling you to do? Oh, that's well said. Get off your butts and go out and talk to people. Befriend people. You know, give them a heart. Make them wonder about you. Why are you so peaceful and calm and all this stuff's going on? Well, because I know who's in charge of all this stuff. Okay, I hope you guys all heard that. <laughs> uh, so the, the big thing Sue just said is, 
get off your seat, <laughs> get up and, and go share with people. And you know, she said something there. I might not be able to share with the people I really want to share with. In other words, there's people close to us that are far from God that we don't always have the opportunity to share with because they're just closed. They're not ready to hear. So we pray for those people who are absolute red lights, who don't want to hear anything about it. And then we go out every day seeking green lights. We go out searching for green lights. Who are the green lights? This morning as I got up, I was thinking, what if everything I say today with everyone I talk to is about Jesus? What if Jesus is just so much on my heart that in every conversation, it's going to go to Jesus? That's what I want to do. That's kind of what Seuss... Right, so rather than worrying about coming food shortages, the gas prices, Sue's saying she needs to be making sure she's focused on Jesus. And that's absolutely right. Someone else. What are you going to do with Joel chapter 1? What's one thing that you're going to say, oh, I'm going to, in my Bible, at the top, over Joel chapter 1, I'm going to write this so that Five years from now, when I look, I'm going to go, oh yeah, Joel chapter 1, that's, that's this. What's that this? What, what's that? that? That you're going to write at the top of the margin in your Bible over Joel chapter 1. You've got something, Deb. No. My R bags that we had laying around. No. And I put a bunch of them in a cooler just to get them off our dining room table. Still had some in a laundry basket. And kids came over and they said, What the heck is all this, Mom? And I said, Well, according to what the Bible is, the Bible is saying, there's going to be a famine. And, you know, kind of went through, like, you know, more frequent earthquakes. And uh, they're talking about the famine. So, so Sue has, Sue, Deb, that's Sue, that's Deb. Deb has four adult kids, and uh, two of those four are married, and then there's six grandkids, and they go to her house on Sunday nights. And recently, I helped Deb mylar bag about 100 pounds of rice and about 40 pounds of beans, and that makes a lot of mylar bags <laughs> to to find homes for. And so when the kids came over, they're looking at all these foil bags of what's going on. And it became an opportunity for her to talk to them about what's coming. Of course, they walked away thinking mom's crazy. But uh, if the shelves empty, they're going to be glad that mom's crazy. So, she knows what she's talking about. <laughs> and, and then you, maybe there's going to be an opportunity for you to be sharing how you knew that from Scripture. So hold on and pray for that opportunity. We don't want to pray for famine, but we want to pray for those opportunities. Yeah. Still. Okay, someone else. What's your application? Cheryl. Prepare for Jesus is coming. Short, simple. You can put that right at the top of your margin over Joel 1, can't you? Someone else. John, I see your fingers moving back there. You got something. Oh, wow. Okay, so first of all, 
this is kind of some meaty stuff. You know, you read it and go, what? I had to spend a lot of time studying this and just wrestling with it over and over and over to get where is Joel going with this? And it makes sense to me now. Um, but in just reading it through, it didn't. And so John's talking about how when we come together, we start discussing it together, how it really, uh, then, we, then we walk away with an understanding. And then secondly, he's saying, our level of prayer should be the same whether, whether we see famine, whether we see the grocery store shelves empty tomorrow or the grocery store shelves full, our level of prayer should be the same. Boy, that's, that's true, isn't it? We should either be thanking God for the harvest or asking God for guidance for the famine. But it should be the same level of prayer and we should still be thanking him for his provisions and praising him, whether it's storm or sunny skies, shouldn't we? That's a great point. Someone else? Robin. Well, verse 16 keeps popping out. Has not food been cut off beef that before our eyes? So just keep a discerning eye and keep a biblical worldview of everything going on. Now, not to get sucked into the world's response to everything. Okay, Robin gets brownie points. Because she even gave us a verse. She said verse 16 before our eyes. Uh, and then I got all excited that she, say that again. <laughs> I was so excited you were listening to a verse. Oh, what that means, what, what you know, that we need to keep our eyes on, on God's word. And, live. Yes, and just making sure that our, my response to everything is through the biblical lens and not responding as the world does. Oh. That is so neat that you say that because whenever I'm looking at current events, I'm always trying to look at current events through the lens of Bible prophecy and make sure I'm interpreting current events through what I know Bible prophecy says. But she's taking that a step further and saying we need to make sure our response to what we're seeing is through Scripture, that our response is laced with Scripture. What a great thought. Great thought. I get so much more when, we, when I get to hear what you guys think. Someone else? What's your takeaway? Someone's going to meet you and see you in the grocery store tomorrow and they're going to say, how was Bible study? What did you learn? What are you going to say? Oh, I fell asleep. That was a cue to my husband to wake up. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Anybody else? You have anything? Someone's going to come to me afterwards and give me something really good, and I'm going to say, why didn't you share that where everyone else could hear it? But that's okay. Um, next week, we will jump into Joel chapter 2. You already have half a study guide for that, because that's all I got done on it. As I get more done on it, I will share more questions, but you should all have that in email uh, looking around, I think pretty much everybody should have that email. If you don't, you can email me, but I think you should have it. And so we'll, we'll resume in Joel chapter 2. And Patty, your grandsons are about to walk in, Patty and Scott. Maybe they're going to join us. <laughs> I'm going to pray, and then we're going to close. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the message that you gave to Joel that applies to our time today. Thank you for the reminder to repent and turn to you while there's still time. Thank you for the reminder to get up out of our seats and be the church that you've called us to be and to be going out and sharing what is going on in the world, how it relates to your prophecy and what we're supposed to do about it. Lord, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a mouth to speak your word. Lord, let us pray to you for guidance of who we're to share it with. Lord, let us love everyone who is around us unconditionally. Let our light shine so that they see you, whether our mouth's open or not. Lord, let our actions demonstrate you. Let our words be laced with scripture. Let, let everything we're doing, whether word or walk, draw others to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everybody.